1246 clarifies two provisions of the National Path of Doctors Act that were unintentionally not part of the original act. First, SB 1246 includes a licensed naturopathic doctor to the list of persons who may perform a clinical laboratory test or examination clarified as waived under CLIA. Wave tests are simple laboratory tests cleared by the FDA for home use. They employ methodologies that are so simple and accurate as to render the likelihood of erroneous results negligible or pose no reasonable risk of harm to the patient if the test is performed correctly. Secondly, SB 1246 would allow MDs to supervise and direct naturopathic assistants with direction and supervision on the DMA listings would only be permitted to assistants just as previously granted to doctors by the Act. The bill further states that the following procedures for patients may be provided through the direct supervision or examination of the doctor. Hi, uh, Dr. Simon Barker, uh, President of the California Naturopathic Doctors Association. Um, we'd also like to be able to hire naturopathic assistants to streamline the process in our office to allow us to uh, uh, see, see more patients and treat patients more efficiently. Thank you. Madam Chair, Tom Riley with the California Academy of Family Physicians. We are uh, listed as support. Uh, we have opposing arguments. Uh, at this moment, we are neither support nor oppose on this bill. Any other witnesses in support? Any witnesses in opposition? Any questions from committee members? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would you like to close on this measure? Just ask for your I vote. Thank you. Motion is due pass to appropriations. Hayashi? Aye. Hayashi, aye. Conway, Ng, Hernandez, Hernandez, aye. Hill, Ma, Nava, Nilo, Ruskin, Ruskin, aye. Smythe, Cook. Aye. Cook, aye. Uh, four to zero, that measure's on call. Uh, so then I will now go in order. Okay. Uh, we will take up SB 294. Madam Chair and members, this bill extends the sunset dates on the licensing boards under the Department of Consumer Affairs that are scheduled to be repealed in 2011. In addition, the bill also adjusts the sunset dates for other boards to meet a four-year schedule of, for legislative sunset oversight hearings of all boards under the department. Extending the sunset dates in this bill anticipates a revival of the sunset review process by the Senate and Assembly Business and Profession Policy Committees beginning with hearings to take place in the fall of this year. Conducting oversight hearings on boards that are being sunsetted enables the legislature to better determine whether the boards are operating in the best interest of consumer protection as they regulate the licensed professions under their jurisdictions. I ask for your I vote. Thank you, any uh, witnesses in support? Opposition, committee members, any questions? Uh, we need a motion on the bill, please. Thank you. Senator, would you like to close? Ask for your I vote. Thank you. 
Motion do pass to appropriations. Hayashi. Aye. Hayashi, aye. Conway. Ng. Hernandez. Hernandez, aye. Hill. Ma. Nava. Nilo. Ruskin. Ruskin, aye. Smythe. Kirk. Aye. Kirk, aye. Hold to zero that measures on call. You have another item yes, to SB present? Yes, 427. Uh, Madam Chair and members, Senate Bill 427 is a consumer protection measure that seeks to close a loophole in existing law regarding replacement airbag fraud. Current law already establishes a misdemeanor penalty and a $5,000 fine for anyone who knowingly sells a car with previously deployed airbags. SB 427 would apply the same penalty to an auto repair shop that fails to restore an airbag to its original operating condition. SB 427 would also require repair shops to disclose to the customer on the final invoice that part switching is illegal. Customers would be directed to contact the Bureau of Automotive Repair if they would like additional information. Since the bill's introduction, we have taken numerous amendments seeking to address opponents' concerns, including removing the requirement that an auto shop provide a copy of the airbag invoice. While these amendments have not removed the opposition, I feel we have gone a long way toward addressing their largest concerns. The legislation is sponsored by the Center for Auto Safety and is supported by the Consumer Union and the Personal Insurance Federation of California, among others. I respectfully ask for your aye vote. And with me here today is Clarence Ditlow, Executive Director for the Center of Auto Safety, yep. sponsor of the bill. Thank uh, you. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Clarence Ditlow. I'm the head of the Center for Auto Safety. And this bill addresses two big uh, uh, features. One is that the Department of Transportation shows that in 20 percent of all crashes where an airbag deployed, it never gets put back in. Uh, and it would make it unlawful to do that. And in addition, uh, in many crash repairs, parts are not installed that are in the original estimate. The total uh, amount of uh, consumer loss in California alone is $350 million. And this bill would uh, provide a statement on the final invoice alerting consumers to this issue and giving them contact information for the BAR, uh, Bureau of Automotive Repair. And we urge your uh, support in passage of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Any other witnesses in support? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Michael Gunning, Personal Insurance Federation. We're here today in support of SB 427. We feel that consumers who are also our policyholders should get the parts, whether they be airbags or repairs, that their premiums pay for. So we're in strong support of the measure. Thank you. Thank you. Any other witnesses in support? Witnesses in opposition? Madam Chair and members, Brian Moss for the California New Car Dealers Association. Uh, as Yogi Berra said, it's deja vu all over again. Uh, this is the third time in the last four years you've essentially heard the same bill. Uh, governors vetoed a prior version twice. Uh, our principal objection is not to the airbag provision in the bill. In fact, if that were the only part of the bill, we'd be supporting it here today. Uh, the problem is, is the superfluous and unnecessary disclosure provisions on the invoice requiring all repair dealers to redo their invoice even though every repair dealer already has a sign in their store with bars 800 number on it. Uh, the disclosure isn't going to do anything to encourage uh, or discourage rather the practice of part switching. Aggressive enforcement by bar would do that, uh, but this bill doesn't do anything for that. So unfortunately, uh, for the third time in the last four years, we're in the same position having to oppose this bill. Thank you. Next witness. Hi, uh, Jack Maladonna on behalf of the California Auto Body Association and the Automotive Service Councils of California. We're also opposed to the bill. And again, we're not opposed to the airbag uh, section. It's primarily the disclosure um, in the bill. I mean, current law already requires repair shops to provide consumers with estimates. Um, stating the types of services and parts they're going to put on the car. Um, if customers are charged for a part um, and the part and the repair shop intentionally installs another part 
without the consent of the consumer, um, that's fraud. And, we, and, and the BAR will enforce that. Um, and, and, and it subjects the, the, uh, the uh, auto repair facility to disciplinary action and revocation of license. Um, what this bill does, and the section we're concerned about, is imposing these additional disclaimers. I essentially, what they'll say is, if we, ch this is in 12-point bo uh, bold print, if we, if the shop charges for a part and doesn't put it on, with consumers uh, puts a different, installs a different part, that's unlawful. It's sort of like going to a restaurant and ordering an Angus beef steak, and then they slip you something different uh, without your knowledge. And that's fraud. I mean, why would you? It, so now are we going to ask the restaurant folks to put a disclaimer on their menu saying if we charge you for an Angus beef but we, you know, we slip something else uh, differently, that's fraud? We think it's redundant. We think it's unnecessary. We think all it's going to do is create more paperwork for uh, shops. Um, it's not going to do anything for the consumer other than probably increase costs. So we respectfully ask you to um, remove the disclaimer provisions in the bill. Uh, and and just keep it as an airbag, increasing the penalties for airbag uh, for the airbags. And uh, anyway, we respectfully, as the bill stands today, we respectfully ask for a, a no vote. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. My name is Alan Wood. I'm uh, representing the Pollution Repair Association of California. Um, we also agree with the co the concept of the the issues regarding airbags. So we think it should be taken further, in that it should not be just the airbag. It should be should the total supplement restraint system that should return to original operating condition and not just limit it to the airbag. We would support that type of an amendment. However, we also oppose some of the redundancy of the bill. In particular, some things that would dramatically affect the collision or the collision repair industry and the repair industry in general in California. There were some subtle changes uh, proposed to 9084.9 that simply changed the wording from supplied to installed. There are many parts that are listed on the invoice in the repair of a vehicle that are not installed on the vehicle. These would think be things like abrasives, uh, cleaners, and things like that. And this language seems to limit the ability of uh, an automotive repair dealer then to charge for those types of items, or at least to modify the estimate for those. So that is a major concern, because that would change dramatically how the repair industry and how the consumer is dealt with. Um, also, the disclaimer creates a great deal of confusion as it currently is because it implies that the automotive repair dealer can change the parts as long as they stay with the same type. Current law specifically prevents that and especially in collision repair, the, the estimate has to be itemized and that itemized estimate cannot be changed without authorization from the customer. So this language creates kind of a, 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 a real confusion for the repairer and would open the door for some people if they wanted to do some sort of, uh, you know, uh, slight hand type stuff, they could, they could pull that off. Um, the, the other issue is, is that um, in the definitions, there's a, we, we seem to have changed the definition of an aftermarket part to, to any part. Um, I think it's important that the consumers know the difference between an OEM replacement part and an aftermarket replacement part. In C of this bill is proposed, all parts are def defined as aftermarket when they're a replacement part. We think that's a, a real misrepresentation of the actual product that's being put on the vehicle and a decision that the consumer should be aware of when they're making a decision to settle that claim based on the policy of insurance that this bill deals with. So we would support the airbag portion, but we would respectfully ask for your no vote as far as the balance goes. Next witness. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Chris Walker for the California Automotive Business Coalition. Uh, we too support the airbag provisions, but for all the reasons already stated, we oppose the remainder of the bill. Thank you. Any other witnesses in opposition? Questions from committee members? Yes, Mr. Ruskin. I have a question, uh, Senator. Good morning. Good morning. Um, in response to the concerns about the uh, putting the wording on uh, about a uh, installing a part other than the type of part. Could you just respond to the, uh, uh, just to inform me again as to the, uh, the value of having that on there? And then uh, within that question, uh, is there some ambiguity that might be raised by the phrase uh, the type of part uh, rather than the part? Uh, I'll let my yeah, we, uh, uh, first of all, in terms, this is, we're informing the consumer that uh, it is unlawful to do that. We are amenable to modifying the, that language where it's, it is unlawful, but we want to keep the 800 number on there for concerns about the auto repair itself. 
because once you're out of the shop, the, aid, the poster does you no good because you're out on the road and you have the car. So you want to know when you have a problem with that car, what's the 800 number per bar, what's the website? And in terms of the type, we'd be willing to sit down and work out language uh, with, to take care of those uh, concerns. But this is a, a big issue, and it's, uh, we can, I informing the consumer of their rights and who to contact, because the biggest question we get is, when you have a repair problem, who do I call? And the, sh the poster on the shop, you know, 20 miles away doesn't help you when you're in your driveway and you can't get the car started or something's going wrong, so you want to call VAR at that moment. Thank you. So you might uh, be willing to consider altering that language to something that uh, might simply say, uh, for uh, information should you have concerns about um, the parts you received uh, in, uh, or whether the, you received the parts that you paid for, uh, call uh, the uh, Automotive Repair Act. That's something you might we, Yes, we can write something uh, more, cl more clearly than that and take out the unlawful word, which is the word that seems to trouble the, uh, the industry. Yes, Dr. Hernandez. Uh, let, let me, uh, does that um, answer some of the concerns to the opposition to some of that language? And I'm assuming you're proposing amendments now, and is the chair willing to take those amendments, or are we going to take them at this time? <coughs> well, we'd have to write something up. It, it well, with the, with the understanding that they, she, you know, I don't know, I can't speak on behalf of the chair, but, you, you know, with the understanding that if it's not, you know, sufficient, that they can, we can call that bill back or take a look at it on the floor because it obviously seems like you're willing to make some amendments to address the, the opposition. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any issue with the bill. I think it's, I think it's a good consumer bill, and, and um, the, the provision that everyone's opposed to is simply a consumer disclosure provision, correct? That's correct. I don't, I don't have an issue with the bill. We're also concerned with some of the language that's uh, contained in the modification of the 984.9 section also that, that changes the requirement from parts supplied to parts installed because it does prohibit charging for items that are used but not necessarily installed. And that's going to be a huge economic impact to the industry, not being able to charge for those things. So, it, you know, it's, if you can't charge for it, it's going to get paid for somehow. That's just the nature of it. So. Mm -hmm. We're concerned with that also. Okay, um, Dr. Hernandez, did you want to propose something? I'm I'm okay with the bill, but I didn't know if you wanted to propose. Well, the, only, <coughs> the only concern I have is is writing policy in committee, and I. But obviously, it seemed like there's some concerns with regard to the wording of the disclosure statement, and the author, of the, or not the author, but the um, sponsor of the bill are willing to address that. I just don't know how we would deal with that in this committee or move it on and deal with it at a different committee. Can we take it up here? I didn't want to, I wasn't uh, thinking of doing it here. I, I don't just think we can take it question. to the floor, can we? Yeah. Madam Chair, yes. I, I just wanted to respond to Assemblymember Hernandez's question about whether tweaking the disclosure statement would remove our opposition. Uh, our problem is fundamentally the negative inference contained in a disclosure statement that says, hey, by the way, if your parts were switched, you can call BAR. I mean, it would be one thing to have a disclosure that said, here's BAR's 800 number, period, if you have questions about your repair. But to have the negative inference that, oh, there may have been parts switched, and the consumer's going, really? W what's that all about? Uh, and again, how is a consumer going to know whether or not an aftermarket fender was the fender that they'd put on their invoice? Most consumers aren't going to be able to tell the difference between an OEM or a non-OEM fender unless they're in the industry. So it's going to raise, in our mind, unnecessary questions. And it, this is the third time we've seen this bill. There have been yeah. dozens of amendments over the last four years, and we still haven't come to any agreement on disclosure. So with all due respect to the uh, Assembly Member's question, 
and with the senator's authorship, we, we haven't come to any resolution. And ironically, uh, you're going to hear another bill by Senator Yee, and some of the opposition raises exactly the same concerns with that measure as we have with this measure, because the c disclosure is unnecessarily duplicative and just doesn't add anything. So for that reason, unfortunately, we'd still be opposed. Madam Chair, yes. uh, Gary Conover representing uh, certified or the Center for Auto Safety. Um, I, th I think as a sponsor, he reiterated, he, he commented on uh, Dr. Hernandez's statement and the author is willing to state, uh, we are w willing to satisfy Mr. Moss's statement that we don't alarm the consumer as to an unlawful activity. However, in the disclosure, the disclosure should say, for additional automotive repair questions, please call bar at the number and the website, give them the website. And that, that is as Mr. Uh, Ditlow commented, when you're 20 miles from the shop, you're not going to see the sign on the wall. The invoice provides the number of the body shop, which the customer can call, and it provides the phone number for bar or their website, which they can research and call. Uh, we think that's a, uh, an acceptable amendment. As far as the other comments about specified versus installed, we're, we're talking about a, a part. And I think the statements went further than just a part. It's the parts installed on your automobile that you want listed and specified on that final invoice. The final invoice also uh, stipulates whether or not there was a change uh, uh, authorized by the consumer from the estimate. These are all consumer disclosure things. Uh, um, it's nothing tricky about it. Uh, it's a straightforward consumer disclosure activity. And I, I might just add, we keep coming back year after year because there is a problem that keeps uh, occurring year after year of uh, this type of fraud in body shop repairs. I'm, I'm willing as the author to, to take those amendments that Mr. Conover said, but that's it. We're trying to do a consumer bill and that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Um, but what you're proposing doesn't address the opposition. So what I would like to do is the move, move the bill as is. And if there are no other questions, would you like to close, Senator? Ask for your I vote. Thank you. Is there a motion? Move, move the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Motion is due pause to appropriations. Hayashi? Aye. Hayashi, aye. Conway? Ng? Hernandez? Hill, Ma, aye. Ma I, Nava, Nava I, Nilo, no. Nilo No, Ruskin, aye. Ruskin I, Smythe, aye. Smythe No, Cook. Uh, four to zero. That measures on calling you two more votes. Okay, thank you very much. Now I take up my last bill, which is SB eleven fifty. Um, Madam Chair and members, 1150 is similar to the provisions of SB 674 yeah. from last yes. year, which received bipartisan support, but which was vetoed by the governor. I am working with the administration this year so we can find a way to provide better oversight of these health care clinics and ensure patient protection. Specifically, this bill will strengthen the regulation and oversight of fertility clinics, surgically clinics performing uh, cosmetic procedures and ensure that quality of care standards are in place at these clinics and checked by the appropriate accrediting agency. S since there is a growing trend in using medical spa type clinics to perform certain cosmetic procedures with little phys physician supervision or oversight, this bill would require the medical board to establish appropriate level of physician availability in these settings. Lastly, this bill will reaffirm the requirement for the Department of Public Health to inspect the peer review process for physicians within hospitals. I ask for your I vote. Thank you. Any witnesses in support? Jennifer Smose, Medical Board of California. And the Medical Board has taken a support position on this bill 
This bill will help to improve the regulation and oversight of outpatient settings, including surgery centers and fertility clinics, by ensuring that quality of care standards are in place and evaluated regularly. The board respectfully urges your I vote. Thank you. Any other witnesses in support? Madam Chair, Tom Riley with the California Society of Dermatology and Dermatologic Surgery urge your support. Thank you. Any witnesses in opposition? Morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee, David Vandegrift with the California Hospital Association. Um, we're just, we have an opposing less amended position on the bill uh, and the specific uh, opposition we have is to the provision of the bill that states it's the intent of the legislature uh, to pursue it to existing regulations to require the department to inspect the hospital's peer review process. We just think the provision is unnecessary because the department already has the authority to do that. Any other witnesses in opposition? Questions from committee members? <coughs> yes, Mr. Nilo. I assume the author previously was aware of the hospital association's concerns. So my question is, what's your problem with uh, amending the bill to remove their opposition? Uh, we're, we're, we're still working with them. We think we may reach a, a well, I'll have the, uh, the consultant from the uh, pers uh, from the Business and Profession Committee respond to this. Thank you for the question, Assemblymember. But the language that we have in our bill, it's an intent language. And the intent language says that the Department of Public Health shall inspect the peer review process. There has been incidences where there has been a failure to conduct peer review at several hospitals here in California. And we believe that there is no issue with assuring that that has to happen once more. It's really an intent language. We just want to make sure that it that DPH understands its responsibility with peer review. Now, that's also a concern that the governor has with the bill and previous iterations have been um, vetoed. Not sure if that's the only reason, but I suspect it's a no, we're, we're working with the administration, so when this bill gets down there, that they will be readily to sign it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, what other concerns do they have besides this one? Uh, I don't think they have, I don't know. There's, or is that it with the administration, too? I think the administration at one time last year, they had um, sponsored legislation by Assemblymember Jones on licensing of all physician-owned clinics. Um, that bill did not go anywhere. We've had several discussions and we continue to discuss options with the governor's office on, on that issue, so. Right. We're working with his office. Any other questions from committee members? Hearing none, we have a motion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, would you like to close? Would you oh, like to close on your measure? Right Thank you. Motion is due pass to health. Hayashi? Aye. Hayashi, aye. Conway? Ng? Hernandez? Hill? Ma? Aye. Ma, aye. Nava? Aye. Nava, aye. Nilo? Aye. Nilo, aye. Ruskin? Aye. Ruskin, aye. Smythe? Aye. Smythe, aye. Cook? Aye. Cook, aye. Seven to zero. Seven to zero. That measures out. Thank you very much, members. Madam Chair. Uh, members, three items have been pulled from um, today's agenda. Uh, file item 2, SB 350. File item 10, SB 1249. File item 11, SB 1410 have been pulled. Senator Corbett, thank you for waiting. No problem. Welcome. I always somehow find something to do with my time. I don't know how that works, but <laughs> there's always something to do. Thank you very much. Uh, members, we're gonna take a file item 5, SB 885. Yes, thank you. We're here on 885. Uh, this is a bill that deals with gift cards. I'm sure every one of you probably have either received one as a gift or purchased one for a friend or family member once upon a time. They are probably the, one, the most important or most uh, a popular gift during the holiday season and for birthdays. Um, this bill is really a follow-up on a bill that I did a couple of years ago. As those of you who are members of the committee back then will remember, uh, there was a bill that passed out of this committee that would allow people to redeem gift cards 
for up to 9.99 in cash and that bill passed out of the committee and was signed by the governor. So for the past two years, Californians have been able to receive some cash back from their gift cards. And why is that important? It's important because uh, people sometimes might receive a gift and it's not at a store where they typically would purchase something. So instead of making a donation to your local retailer, that person has the opportunity to at least get some cash back. And also it's convenient for purchasers, if they buy something and there's a little bit change back on the card, they have the opportunity to get a couple of dollars back um, to put in their pocket, spend on groceries or things like that, as opposed to putting it in their pocket or their top drawer and forgetting it forever so it's never redeemed. Now we found out over the last couple of years that um, people are very um, happy with this legislation. In fact, my office gets calls all the time. But unfortunately, s many of the calls that we get are from people who have been to their local retailer and the retailer has told them, oh, we don't redeem these cards for cash. And so sometimes the people leave empty handed and sometimes the people ask to speak to the manager and the manager is kind enough to come out front and say, oh yeah, that's right. It is state law now in California that you redeem uh, for cash. So, uh, and also in some cases, consumers are not aware that they have the opportunity to get cash back. So we want to make sure that after we worked so hard to get this bill passed and the governor was nice enough to sign it, that retailers and consumers alike are aware of the law and that the law will be enforced, a law that's on the books in California. And so what this bill does, the bill did other things previously, but it's been amended. And primarily what this bill now does is it would require that there be a statement on this card that would have uh, language so that people understand that the card can be redeemable for cash. Uh, there's ongoing discussions about what this language actually should be. I am very happy to um, work with the retailers and others as to what that language would be, but we wanna make sure it's couched in positive terms. Currently, most cards have a statement either that says it's only redeemable for $5, which of course is not the law in California, and or some dollar amount. This Banana Republic card, for example, says $5. Or it says something in the negative, like this card is not redeemable for cash uh, unless by state law. So what we're proposing is just a slight change that would have it stated in the positive. It can be general to address the concerns because of state lines. It could say something like, this card is redeemable for cash value pursuant to state law, or something general. So we're proposing, um, also in this bill that um, I know that the, the, there was a concern about, uh, some people mentioned that the type size might be too large and not, might not fit in with the design the cards already have. So we're proposing that we would strike from the bill um, the requirement of a 10 point font size. So that would allow the statement to be very flexible and give us a chance to talk with the retailers as this bill moves on uh, to come up with something reasonable that would still allow notice to consumers and notice to retailers so that this bill can be, um, uh, excuse me, the law on the books can be enforced and people can be aware of that. So what I have with me are amendments that reflect the striking of the 10 point font size and also an amendment that reflects uh, something that was requested by uh, the uh, small business folks uh, that there should not be any requirement that uh, there's a notice uh, on the card that has to be shown at the time, or visible at the time of sale. We address their concern by this other amendment. So these amendments are available for you to take a look at. I know there might have been um, a misunderstanding about whether I was requesting that there not be any notice placed on the card, uh, but uh, my intent in my discussions were that the font size be removed, the 10 point font size um, amendment. So that's, and that's why this was drafted and um, these are the amendments that I would like to offer if the committee is so interested. But I think it is extremely important that the notice remain on the card so that when people have it and they go to the store, they can let the retailer know they have the right to get their cash back. Thank you, any witnesses in support?
of the measure. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. My name is Michelle Judd from Consumers Union. We are in support of the bill. Um, it basically just provides more notice to consumers and to merchants about the law that is on the books. Um, as we understand that there have been difficulties in um, obtaining compliance, especially on the merchant's end um, due to just not knowing about the law. So we urge your I support, or I vote on this bill. Thank you. Any other witnesses in support? Witnesses in opposition? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, not in opposition. Uh, actually, uh, we are removing our opposition with the amendments uh, that the Senator agreed to take today, specifically regarding uh, removing the visible prior to purchase um, provision from the, the bill, language of the bill. Who is he representing? I'm uh, sorry, Michael Shaw with the National Federation of Independent Business. Thank uh, you. The, we're one of the small business groups that had requested that amendment. Thank you. Witnesses in opposition? Margaret Gladstein on behalf of the California Retailers Association. Um, we have not had the uh, opportunity to view the amendments that the author just discussed in committee today. Um, but generally speaking, we would probably maintain uh, our opposition. In fact, I'm sure we'll maintain our opposition. We think that uh, it's uh, unworkable and unnecessary to require this type of disclosure. Unworkable uh, because it would require a California specific card for national retailers, um, which we oppose. Large retailers mm -hmm. would um, be required to make sure what they provide to consumers that purchase online or in stores has this disclosure on it. And uh, we find that to be unworkable. Um, secondly, we think it's unnecessary. We do acknowledge that when the bill first went into place, there were some compliance issues. There have been uh, both large and, right and small retailers who have suffered consequences for not complying with the law. But we know specifically that uh, both consumers and retailers are, um, the vast majority are now aware of it. And um, let me just cite three examples I've recently learned from our members at uh, the California Retailers Association. Uh, first, there's been one large retailer that last year redeemed over 63,000 cards in cash. Another retailer from 08, 09 had a 50% increase in cash redemp redemptions. And finally, one of our largest members also has programmed their computers and their cash registers so that there's less than $10, they instantly provide cash back to the consumer. So um, again, we think the bill is unworkable and unnecessary, and for those reasons, we oppose. Next witness. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Mira Gurton here on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce. We have also not had a chance to review the amendments. Um, however, I suspect we will remain in opposition for the reasons previously stated. Um, really, um, really just a big problem with the fact of having unique requirements for in-state um, cards versus out-of-state cards would be very difficult for a lot of retailers, particularly smaller ones. Thank you. John Caldwell. California Grocers Association, I've also not seen the language, but the, the overall problem remains a kind of a, a disclosure for gift cards that are manufactured one place and shipped nationwide that have to have California only is a big problem. Matt Sutton with the California Restaurant Association with many of the same concerns. Haven't seen the language, um, but have discussed with the Senator's staff um, the notion of flexibility for compliance and th that, is, that is sort of the gist of where we are at this point. Witness. Madam Chair, members, Amy Brown on behalf of Safeway. Uh, we have not reviewed the language, but we appreciate the willingness to, to uh, put out a compromise. There are federal, as the Senator said, there are federal law uh, requirements in terms of the notifications on the back of the card. Um, the uh, problems that we see are the state to state differences uh, in the logistics because we sell these cards all over the country. Thank you. Madam Chair, members, Stacey Dwelly on behalf of Target and the Home Depot, and want to reiterate all the concerns that were already raised. We appreciate the efforts to amend the bill, but it would be a California-specific bill with mandatory disclosures that we don't believe will fit on the card. And selling online cards, you'd have to have a California-specific online sale. Um, and we have various cards that we promote that are different sizes and shapes. Um, we already put on the cards that they may be redeemable for cash if it's allowed in that state. So we believe the bill is working. Is what? The lo current law current is law. working. Um, George Miller on behalf of Walmart. Uh, we are the actual the, the entity that did return over 63,000 uh, balances on these, on these cards uh, in, the, in the last year. 
Um, so we think that it's clear evidence that it is working. Um, some of the cases that were alluded to about retailers that didn't, uh, we've also read about the large uh, fines and, and lawsuit settlements that they've uh, had to deal with. So uh, at, at one point or another, it's being enforced. And I think that as those come to, to light, that more and more of the smaller retailers that may not uh, quote unquote know about it are quickly becoming very aware of, of this. And this is just another um, step that we don't, don't really feel is necessary. Which lawsuit are you referring Madam, to? Madam Chair and members, Ed Manning on behalf of Best Buy in opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Any other witnesses in opposition? Madam Chair, John Valencia representing the 150 members of the California Association of College Stores. Over 140 are publicly owned by the uh, UC, CSU, and community college districts. So we believe the bill has an inadvertent uh, public uh, mandate, although it's not keyed as such. And as a practical effect, the bill has the effect of requiring our stores to maintain two stocks of certificates to comply with the projected mandate. As you might guess, so much of our supply is used for promotions, for discounts, for fraternities, sororities, and other charitable activities. And the other impact would be that we sell some at regular price. We are opposed to the measure. Madam Chair and members, Caitlin Vega for the California Labor Federation. I apologize for coming up at the wrong time. We are in support. Thank you. Thank you. Any other witnesses in support or opposition? Any questions from committee members? I have a question. It may have been touched upon by some of the opponents, but um, how how is the are there different requirements for different states with respect to notification? Um, Presently, I mean, are there are there other states that that have what this bill attempts to do? Yeah, well, you're the only one that stood up uh, <laughs> in recognition of all the courage of your uh, colleagues. And there there are other states that do allow for redemption of different values. We're not the only state. Okay, uh, that is correct. California, I'm sorry, Margaret Gladstein, behalf of the California Retailers Association. There are other state requirements. California has the highest cashback requirement. The way the other state uh, disclosure laws work they're very general so the current statements that many of you see on the back of your gift cards comply with those state laws the way this bill uh, I believe would work even with the amendments that were described it would create a California specific requirement that would be unique compared to other state disclosure requirements that are much more general can you give me an example I mean what uh, because it seems to me that part of the argument is that you've got large retailers that do business across the country, obviously do business in states that, that have some feature that allows the redemption. A and so what language has been found to satisfy those other jurisdictions? Sure. Um, and I'm not quoting verbatim, but I think if you look on the back of many cards, you'll see a disclosure that says, uh, redeemable for ca not redeemable for cash unless allowed by state law unless or unless required sorry unless required by law mm -hmm. that alone covers what we think covers California and the other states that require cash back and, and so and so this legislation would be different from that in in what way well it, I'd almost have heard it off on that because well, let I let me ask the, the language, author then how, 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 how would your bill how would you it would not be different there would be a notice. There would be the opportunity to discuss with the retailers and any other interested party to make the sure that the language is something that they can work with. That has been on the table since the beginning of time as this bill has moved along. Um, and we have had the opportunity to work with uh, some of the individuals who have removed their opposition, actually. So the only thing we're concerned about is um, most cards now phrase it in the negative. In other words, and Ms. Glass Gladstein just mentioned that, that it's not redeemable. So really, we're not talking about any extra space on the card. We're talking about reworking that language so it's worded in the positive so that this card may be redeemable pursuant to state law. We understand the issue that these cards may travel from state to state. This is not the first time legislators have done legislation in California that may impact other states. Mm -hmm. We deal with this all the time. And we're very open to working with them on the language. We believe that it's reasonable. We believe that the bill is pared down. The very last 
proscriptive element of the bill is the size of the font size. We're willing to take that out. So this is really a very, very small measure that should fit within what is already done on other cards that will allow people to understand that they can have their cards redeemed. Mr. Manning? Yes, thank you, Mr. Nava. Uh, on behalf of Best Buy, if you read the bill, it says that um, sh the, the, a gift certificate sold after January 1st, 2012 shall be printed with a statement stating that any gift certificate with a cash value of less than $10, which is unique to California, is redeemable in cash for its cash value. So it is a specific mandate for a s for specific language and Mr. that is different than any other state and would create a specific requ disclosure requirement for, uh, for cards sold only in California. Mm -hmm. And so for a national retailer, that's, that's a very difficult issue to deal with. And, and uh, Mr. Nava, to follow on on that, as I've already said, and I've said in any conversations I have had with the opposition, that would be, we would be willing to allow them to help decide what that language is. We're here today with an amendment that takes out the font size. We would be willing to work on the language to make sure that uh, we can address their concerns. And that has been there all along, and we just haven't had a, a reach back on that, although we have been extremely open. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other? Questions from committee members? Yes, Mr. Ruskin. Some of the uh, cards, I assume, uh, have the language on the back of it at this point. Yours, That's your bill, correct. your bill would require that the language be moved to the front. Uh, no, it no. would not. The bill says that you, it can be front or back. It's on page uh, 19. Excuse me, page two, line 19. It could be front or back. So here's the scenario. Okay. Under this law, we could work on the language that meets the concern about moving from state to state. There would not be a prescriptive type size and uh, the concerns about it uh, creating a problem with the design on the front um, really are not well founded under this bill because there was never any requirement it, that it be on the front size side. So. Really, uh, once again, I'm just asking members to support this measure so we have the opportunity for people to understand that they have this right to get their cash back. Five billion dollars of cards still get unredeemed in our country every year, despite the fact that this bill has, this law has been on the books in California for the past two years, and there are laws on the books in other states. And this discussion today is really not about you know, that bill, because that was passed and signed with many of your help, thank you very much. But it's really about whether we want to say that the work that we, that we have done in the legislature, that that information is available to our consumers so they can, by their, you know, right, get a few dollars back on their gift cards. And so that it doesn't end up in the pocket of the retailers. I, for the life of me, cannot understand any great argument as to why we would make it more difficult for people to understand that they have the right to get their money back. And it's just $9.99 or less. Um, and also, it's important to allow the retailers to understand and know as well. Recently, uh, KPIX5 did a, did a little story in San Francisco and they followed a woman as she went from store to store trying to redeem her gift cards. And pretty much every store she went to, she was told, no, we don't redeem these for cash. And in most cases, they did show that the, uh, you know, it was, it was inadvertent that the person at the cash register just didn't realize it was the law. The manager came forward and, and corrected it. In some cases, the retailer wasn't aware either. Why wouldn't we want the retailers to understand what the state law is so they don't have this problem? So as I've said, all the issues that have been raised with, <coughs> with the concerns about you know, state to state, it could be confusing, it's too big, it's, you know, it's on the wrong side of the card. Those are all either dealt with or will be dealt with. And, you know, I'm very glad to work with all of you. Um, and it is, it is a very important consumer law and would appreciate your, your support. Mr. Eng. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just for the sake of um, clarity, when you close, could you just summarize if you are taking specific 
amendments, and you can just summarize that. And I apologize if you've already said it before. Um, my question was uh, uh, to the retailers, I don't know if they want to come back up, but there's been, um, I, I think, a very compelling argument made that there is hardship uh, when national uh, chains have exceptionalism to particular states. So my question is this, um, is it the position of the retailers that this would be the only um, instrument, product, um, item in which there's an exception for one out of 50 states, that there is no other um, product that you know of that has any kind of exceptionalism. And I say this not to be cute, but when I go online, perhaps, um, and I do pay my sales tax and my use tax, um, <laughs> but when I go online, we, we um, I, <laughs> I, I, the first thing they ask for is a zip code mm -hmm. or a state. And if, and I've actually done this, and if you vary from state to state, there's always something that's going to be different, a disclosure um, about something. And it's not just California, but I was just wondering, and I don't know about, about, about what the, the burden of the retailers. So my question, again, I'll just summarize, is is it the representation of the retailers that this would be the only time in the history of retail products in which California, there was one state that had an exception? And if not, then what were those others? Assembly member, I, I'm not sure I could speak to the body of California law. Certainly, as the representative of the California Retailers Association, we wish this would be a unique requirement. There have been other requirements passed by law. Um, it doesn't mean we enjoy them, uh, but we certainly attempt to comply with them um, and um, you know, have probably sat before this committee and other committees and opposed those requirements as we do today. So it, it would not be unique, but it does not make it more palatable to us. Okay, and then my and Madam Chair, just the follow-up, and, and thank you for your um, being cogent about that. And so is there anything about this particular instrument that would be uh, more uh, financially distressful to the industry as opposed to those other states that impose their own requirements? Well, the, the way this bill is, is worded, it would not allow for the sort of generic disclosure that I discussed earlier to be applicable. And it would require unique product to be uh, distributed in California. There would be have to be a unique uh, process for gift cards sold to California consumers online. Um, so yes, there would be an, a, an additional burden. And so no other state, and that generic one applies to 50 states. That's and correct. And California would be the only one that would do this. That's Thank correct. <coughs> Dr. Hernandez has a question, but did you want to uh, respond to this specific issue? I, I did. I wanted to respond to Assemblymember Ng's uh, question. Um, in order to, to make a different state disclosure online, it's very simple. It's a matter of programming. It's not a matter of space. And what we have here is a matter of space. I think most of us, especially those of us that have children, are very aware of these. This is more, uh, I think this is used more for birthday parties than, than the gifts that you and I are used to uh, having received when we were young, in part, in fact, because we don't like to wrap, and so we buy these, and kids love it because they get to pick out whatever it is they want. This happens to be from our competitor, but that's because they're right down the street from my house. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we but in any event, it is an issue of space, and I'll pass this card around. If you look at the back, there is a generic disclosure that uh, meets the requirements uh, of all 50 states, including California, is current in order to uh, – it allowing people to understand that in many states there is the ability to redeem for cash. And so if you look at this, I'm not sure where you're going to put the new disclosure um, on this, as well as there's also the issue of just the manufacturing runs of having a separate state, uh, single state disclosure that we would have to try and do and coordinate. But I'll just pass this around for your. Is there any value on that card? <laughs> $11. Thank you, Madam Chair. Concept, please. Of course. We, um, um, you know, I, I know that the retailers keep coming back up here to say that um, it's a state-specific disclosure, it's a state-specific disclosure, and 
I don't mean to be flip, so pardon me, but it has already been established that I have been willing all along to allow for generic information. We just don't want the cards to say it is not redeemable unless by state law. We want it to be phrased in the positive so people don't read it and go, oh my God, it's not redeemable. And if you look at these, they're pretty small and they're kind of hard to read, especially when they're printed in silver. But um, uh, so that issue is moot because I have already given you my commitment to work with them to find language that meets the state the state concern that they have and also fits within the card. And in fact, I would be happy with just replacing the wording now that says it's not redeemable and replace it with fewer words that tell you that it is redeemable. And in quite frankly, you could do it in fewer words True. in a positive context. Yeah. So it would fit. Finally, Dr. Hernandez. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I do appreciate your concern and comments and your willingness to work with the opposition. Um, my understanding, uh, according to the retailers, is that there are other states that have uh, generic language. Mm -hmm. And as, as putting aside that, let's say you didn't want to work with them, but in the event that the way that it's printed on there now, and then if this law were to pass in its entirety, then would there be an added, um, I'm assuming there would be an added line to what's currently in the card right now, is that correct? Uh, no, like I said, we would work with the retailers. No, but I'm just asking you a hypothetical, how, if that were the case. No, I'd like to work with them so that it fits their card the way they'd like it to fit. I, I don't have any extra interest in making it bigger or printing it in purple or whatever. Yeah, okay, I just well, want the information well, on the card so people can show the retailer that they're entitled to get their money back pursuant to state law. So what you're asking is that w this committee pass the bill along, that it's a work in progress, that it What's, I'm assuming it goes to appropriations next, if there's no other policy I, committee? I, I would be glad to have um, uh, amendments drafted for your review as the bill goes to the floor. And w how is the opposition feel to this now that the authors has this willingness to work with them to state the language such that it's no longer California specific and so that it's no longer um, requiring additional space? And I I'm sorry to have you I come back, but- I think know the answer to that question. <laughs> We're still opposed. I, I don't think it's workable that you disclose to the consumer that it's redeemable for cash under California law and in turn not have a California specific disclosure. We think the existing language on the card where it says may re redeem for cash where allowed by law or something to that effect um, covers California and. This may not. Um, That's the problem, the may not part. Okay, cannot be redeemed for cash um, unless required by law. Um, w w that covers both California and the other states where there's a cash back requirement. So we do think that um, what the authors discussed here today would in some way require a unique California disclosure. And so we're still opposed. I'm not asking for that, but just for the record. Madam Chair, on behalf of Best Buy, responding to Mr. Hernandez's question, the, the reason that the disclosure is written the way it is now is th an important distinction, which is not every state has a cash back requirement, number one. So to imply on a card that is distributed nationally that there is, in fact, a cash back requirement is misleading consumers because it varies state to state, as does the amount. And that's why the generic statement is the way it is now, which refers to the state law. And, and so that's the difficulty when you're dealing with, uh, you know, a national uh, gift card and a, a national chain trying to comply with all these laws. Thank you. Mira Gurton on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce, I would like to align myself with the former statements. And I know this is going to sound argumentative, but I suppose my question is, I know that this concern has been on the table all along. She has been very willing to meet with the different stakeholders. We have expressed this concern in the past. She came with amendments today, and yet this amendment hasn't been breached. And you know, our concern is we've reached the point where we should have come to that agreement, and we haven't, and it does need to be something that is not state specific, and we didn't get there in time. So we continue to oppose. Senator Corbett. <laughs> okay, so once again, um, the objections to the measure uh, really are not, um, you know, 
well, for lack of a better word, they're, they're moot because the agreement and the commitment would be to allow generic language that uh, can cross state lines. That is something that I've thought about throughout the bill and would be fine with. This is not the first time I've ever seen a bill that affects uh, transactions across state lines. You know, we did this bill two years ago and that was discussed. So this is not an issue that's not familiar to me. So the concerns that have been addressed about the California specific language um, should be addressed by um, my commitment to make amendments that would allow for gen a general uh, statement. So um, that should be dealt with. Um, again, once again, members, I'm just basically um, asking you to support this bill in order to allow it to move forward so people can be aware that there is state law on the books that allow them to get their cash back. Um, with regard to the statement that we should have been farther by now, um, I have been the person who has been open to address the concerns. Unfortunately, I've gotten a lot of feedback from folks that the retailers have told members that they would not like the bill amended because it would be easier to kill it. So there really hasn't been, um, uh, you know, I've reached out and flexed and amended this bill uh, to pieces and all that's left is a generic statement that says you can get your cash back pursuant to state law and I think that that should be enough for people to support this bill because it doesn't create, it won't create any of the problems that, that have been addressed. There won't be a California specific notice, it won't be a certain size, it won't be on the front. Um, all of the things that have been brought up in opposition um, have been dealt with by my commitments and that's why I've been lucky enough to um, have uh, opposition removed by NFIB as you've heard uh, and I've also heard that the independent grocers and the small business association although they weren't here today uh, believe that it's moved in the right direction with these amendments as well and so um, I hope you can support the bill I think I've done everything I can uh, to alleviate uh, the real the true concerns um, and uh, I'd appreciate your I vote Okay, Mr. Ruskin, um, I'll recognize you. And then I, I have a proposed um, compromise on this bill and I'd like to make a comment, right. so please. Well, here's the, my current thinking. Uh, having seen the, uh, that's a target card we just saw, um, with the author removing the stipulation as to font size, you turn that target card over and uh, you probably have to be lost on a desert island with nothing to do to desire to read it. But uh, because it's very, uh, it's, the font is extremely small and I can't imagine endeavoring to read it except upon uh, the rare day when we have nothing to do. Uh, but um, so I, I don't see the harm <laughs> having the font size removed and being able to put it on the back, I don't see the harm. I, I, I think there is generic language that is possible that would be maybe re uh, redeemed for uh, cash value where required by law. Um, and I think I might see the, uh, with that, uh, the, the disfavor of the uh, merchants though, uh, because then people in other states might say, well, why, it's not required here. Why can't you give it back to me anyway? Um, and so it might lead <laughs> in other states to those kinds of laws. But uh, I, I just don't, I'm beginning to see, I think what I'm willing to do is to uh, vote aye on this today and then hopefully the, uh, the wording will be changed uh, by the next time I see it and I'll have further discussions with the retailers to understand their concerns should there be positive wording, I'm not guaranteeing I'll vote for it on the floor, um, but uh, I'm, I'm wondering if that is the concern of the retailers, that if there is a positive statement, it may produce some angst uh, by uh, customers in those other states who say, well, it may not be required, but how can I get my three bucks back? Of course, in a small font size, they're highly unlikely ever to read it. At any rate. point of a clarification, if, um, if, if the representative from Safeway or Mr. Miller could clarify the federal law requirement disclosure, 
Can someone clarify that, please? There, there are um, federal notification requirements, but they're not specific, nor are they, they uh, font size specific, specific either. If I understand. Okay. Um, Senator, I, I could address that date. further as well. Um, it generally applies to cards that have expiration dates, in which case most of the retailer cards issued in California and other states do not have expiration dates, so it doesn't necessarily apply here, as well as um, fees on top of that. So the disclosure that's on the Target card is done voluntarily right now, is that correct? Well, the federal law goes into effect in August, um, but as for fees, it will require them wherever they apply. So if there's a fee, then it must be on the card. I'm sorry, the, which federal law goes in effect? Uh, the Credit Card Act of 2009. There's a gift card provision that goes in, into effect August 22nd. Okay, and what is that requirement? Um, there are various disclosure requirements. So with the expiration date, and this is where we get into the different kinds of gift cards. So generally the retailer issued gift cards, if there's an expiration date, then there's a requirement underneath the date that the funds don't expire until five years. Um, that was passed by Congress, but that wouldn't apply here since for the most part there aren't expiration dates on retailer cards. Um, as well as a disclosure of fees where they're applicable. Okay. Um, Senator Corbett, as you know, I supported your bill two years ago and you've been a champion for consumers and we really appreciate all the work you've done on this. Um, I think compliance is something that, you know, we definitely want to see um, and, you know, it's the enforcement of these bills that basically make a big difference. So I appreciate you bringing this bill forward. Um, with all the concerns addressed um, today, I'm wondering if you'll be willing to take an amendment, which I think will address uh, Mr. Ruskin, your point as well. Um, I will not be able to support the bill as currently drafted, and I think if you could um, let me read this uh, proposed amendment, which I would be able to support with, with the proposed amendment. Do you have um, a copy of that? Yes, I just have that here, but I'll just read it for the benefit of the committee members. Uh, a retailer of gift uh, certificates shall disclose that any gift certificate with a cash value of less than $10 is redeemable in cash for its cash value. Um, so it doesn't require that it be on the gift card itself, but that retailers should in fact disclose this to consumers and I believe this will meet your goal in terms of uh, educating the public and, and letting people know that your original legislation did pass um, but it doesn't require that it be on the gift card itself. Um, and if this is acceptable to you, Senator, I will be happy to support your bill today. Senator Hayashi, um, before I respond, I would just like one of my witnesses in support didn't have an opportunity to make a comment, and he might want to comment to this amendment. Of course. Just, just very briefly, thank you, Madam Chair. Ignacio Hernandez on behalf of the Consumer Federation of California in support of the bill. My only comment, again, I have, I'm just looking at this language now, is that having the language on the bill, on, on, the, on the gift card, uh, is helpful for consumers so when they go to a store and try to then have current law enforced, uh, that the cashier or somebody working there may say, well, wait a minute, that's, you know, they don't know the law, so they say, you know, you can't turn it in, you can't redeem it. The consumer can then say, no, look, it's on the card. Right. And that's where yeah, it's helpful. And, and I'm not right. sure where the disclosure would be. I don't know if you were be. here uh, when the opposition I testified. Um, I think we've had pretty good discussion. Okay. Um, and I, I understand why you would want the information to be on the gift card, but it's, um, to me, there's a lot of confusion about what is currently required by the federal law now and, and the new federal law that's going to be enacted as of August. It's also unclear uh, what, what the real retailers could do um, in a practical manner because we, you know, there has to be some balance in terms of what the businesses are required to do and I have to believe that they want to comply with the state law because as committee analysis clearly states, when you don't comply with this law, they are sued and they are having to pay huge amounts of monies 
to set all these claims, and I don't think that retailers want to get sued. So I would like to believe that the retailers, in fact, want to comply with this. Um, and so, again, my proposal is that that um, the author consider take this amendment today. If not, um, I will not be able to support the bill. Obviously, um, the senator has said several times that she's willing to work with the opposition, so I'm happy to have the bill put over and convene stakeholder meetings to craft a compromise if, if she wishes. Um, but this, this, I think this amendment will address some of the concerns okay. that have been expressed just by members. Let me just ask this question up front. Well, I would just request, no, you know, if this bill doesn't make it out of committee today, that I request reconsideration. So I just want to get that up front. Um, so, uh, again, this whole long discussion today and the whole long discussion as this bill has moved forward is that there be notice on the card. That's really the whole crux of the matter. So that people have the opportunity to show the retailer that they do have the opportunity to get cash back. And so the retailer also has the information. Um, this amendment totally removes whatever's left of the bill. The, the bill is a notice on the card bill. And um, we did have the opportunity to discuss that, Madam Chair, when you and I met and I told you my concerns at that time. So I, I, it would just really be going against the entire purpose of this legislation um, to, to accept this amendment. We might as well just rip my bill up because there's really nothing left of it. So um, I, I would not be able to take this amendment. There's also the issue of if a person purchases the gift card and gives it as a gift, that person's not there for the disclosure that whatever whatever that disclosure is that the retailer gives. And and this amendment doesn't delineate the, the, the disclosure. It doesn't say there has to be a posting or a sign in the store. There's, there's nothing in here that says what the disclosure would be by the retailer. So I'm, I'm very sorry. I appreciate uh, your efforts, but it would not make any sense at all for me to um, to take this amendment because it totally wipes out whatever's left of the bill. Okay, unfortunately this bill goes to the floor. Um, so I would like us to be able to work on this bill in this committee. Um, so this is my proposed amendment. I apologize that we haven't had this follow-up discussion on the bill, but I'm happy to obviously continue working okay, with you. Um, yes, Is it Ms. possible Ma. to get a vote on the bill today and see where it goes and then uh, have reconsideration if it doesn't make it? Absolutely. I'm hoping it makes it. Absolutely. It um, so we'll hear from Ms. Ma and then Ms. Renava, did you have another question? Okay. Yes, no, um, thank you, uh, Senator Corbett, and I, and I applaud your efforts to um, get the law changed because I do think it is important. Um, part of my struggle was how our consumers going to be educated about the law. And I think uh, we have I've seen that salespeople may not know about it and then you have to call a manager to come out. Well, part of you know my struggles is, well, what are the retailers doing to actually inform the customers that um, they, um, they can get cash back? So uh, my thing was not about the gift cards necessarily because I think what was printed on the gift card suffices in 49 other states and 50 states up until you know uh, today, where um, you're challenging you know those statements saying not redeemable unless required by law, mm -hmm. um, so I had a didn't really feel it was necessary to change the gift card, but um, I did feel that there was not enough notice uh, to the consumers. So mm -hmm. I don't know whether you can work with the retailers, whether it's you know at point of sale or um, I'm not really sure how you know they all do their, their own notices, but um, I do like where Ms. Hayashi is going in terms of uh, better notification for the consumers that this law uh, has passed and that they are eligible to get cash back under $10. Mr. Nava? Yeah, the, the, the chair made a suggestion that the bill be put over to allow additional, do we have time to do that? Yes. It's right. single refer to our committee and it goes to the floor, so we do have time, yes. Well, uh, let me just suggest to the author, I've only been here six years, um, but I'm looking at this lineup. Do you really want to vote? Um, you know, sometimes you just kind of want to see where you are. <laughs> so.
But if you think Mr. Nava, I should put it over, I would defer to your Look, I, I wisdom as a member of the committee. Well, wisdom is, you're, not, you're gonna get a fight over that one. But, <laughs> but my, my, my sense of it is that you've had some questions by members talking about additional time to craft language that would satisfy the retailers, and if not satisfying the retailers, satisfying the members. That you've made that you've made the effort to try to craft language that would be suitable. I, I would just suggest that the chair um, offered that we have the time. It might be a, a, an appropriate way to proceed. I think that's also something that I would like to see happen. If the if the amendments wouldn't uh, satisfy uh, the members, e even then. Okay, very good. Um, so the chair would be open to amendments that aren't exactly like this. I'll be committed to working with you, Senator, and crafting something that okay, um, that is amenable to you and others. Okay, great. So, we can thank you for with, uh, supporters and talk. To Absolutely, them. we'll okay. we'll be happy to. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, members. Um, we only have uh, one item. Um, one more item to take up. Senator uh, Correa couldn't be here uh, with us today. Um, SB 694 um, is a measure that will authorize the Uniform Construction Cost Accounting Commission to impose a reasonable fee. There is no opposition to the bill. Members, if you're, um, if you're okay with this, I'd like to move for a vote. Thank second. you, is there a second? second? Thank you, please call the roll. Please call the roll. Motion is Dupas, Hayashi. Aye. Hayashi, aye. Conway. Aye. Conway, aye. Ng. Ng, aye. Hernandez. Aye. Hernandez, aye. Hill. Ma. Aye. Ma, aye. Nava. Aye. Nava, aye. Nilo. Aye. Nilo, aye. Ruskin. Smythe. Aye. Smythe, aye. Cook. Aye. Cook, aye. Nine to zero, that measures out. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, members, we have some measures on call. I'm gonna lift the call on file item six, SB 1008 by Senator Padilla, current vote, vote four to zero. Please, uh, please call the absent members. Conway, aye. Conway, aye. Ng, aye. Ng, aye. Hill, Ma, aye. Ma, aye. Nava, aye. Nava, aye. Nilo, aye. Nilo, aye. Smythe. Aye. Smythe, aye. Ten to zero, that measures out. Um, we're gonna lift the call on item number nine, SB 1246. Please call the absent members. Conway, Conway, aye. Ng, Ng, aye. Hill, Ma. Item nine. Ma I Nava Nava I Nilo Nilo I Smythe I Smythe I Ten to zero. Ten to zero. That measures out. Um, we're also going to lift the call on item number one, SB two ninety four. Conway Conway I Ing Ing I Hill. Ma, Ma, I, Nava, Nava, I, Nilo, Nilo, I, Smythe, Smythe, I. 10 to zero, that measures out. Um, item number three, SB 427. Please call the absent members. Conway. Ing, Ing, I, Hill. Hernandez, I. Thank you. Six to two, that measures out. Uh, members wishing to add on could do so.